Okay. Okay, so let us begin with three bows to the triple gem. One, two, three. And then we'll do the salutation. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the perfectly enlightened one. Okay, so we'll be continuing now with our reading of the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses of the Buddha, and the Book of the Fives. And the group of suttas that we'll be discussing today deal with different aspects of, especially of family life, call it family household and family relations. And this is sutta number 39. And I'm a little bit apologetic about this because you can see that it certainly has a kind of gender bias in it. But we have to remember that this is sutta is taking place that the Buddha is teaching against the background of the Indian culture of his time. Okay, so this sutta is called Sun, and it says, considering five prospects, or maybe simply five things, yeah, five, yeah, five cases, the mother and father wish for a son to be born in their family. And so why does it say a son? Not just a son or a daughter, but a son and again, this is what takes place in traditional Indian families back in the Buddha's time, and probably even today in families which still adhere very much to the traditional culture. I'm not sure whether we have any Indian people in our... Yes, Bhante, that's so true. <laughs> Yeah, I see Jignasa is here. She is from Mumbai. Maybe. No, no, Bhante, it's not true, any. It's not true. I think it's still true because they prefer a male birth as opposed to a female. But I think times are changing and the yeah. tide is changing. Yeah, definitely times are changing. But this is a traditional idea. You see what happens if when the child grows up and they get married. Okay, the young man marries the girl, a young woman, they don't go off and set up their own household completely independent. You know, if the family is living, say, in Mumbai, a couple gets married, they might go off to Delhi or Calcutta or Chennai to set up a family or some town outside of Mumbai. But the husband and the wife will move into the extended family of the boy's pe parents. And so the girl becomes, who's the wife, becomes a part of the greater household of her husband. And so the son will remain with the extended family, but the girl will leave her family to join with the family of the son. And so this is why the mother and father wish for the son. This is, again, the traditional family. We have the thought, having been supported by us, he will support us. And then the second, he will do work for us. But I have to say, <laughs> what happens in truth, he will support us, but she, the wife, will do the work for us. Is that true or not? In the ancient yeah, times, probably, Bhante, yeah, in the ancient times, <laughs> things are changing now, though, so we have to take that into consideration. Yeah, things are changing, <laughs> but the Buddha is speaking in 500 yes. BC, not of in, course, not back in then. 2022. Yeah. Yes, that's very true. <laughs> okay, then the family lineage will be <laughs> will be extended. So it gets, again, since it's a patriarchal type of society, so the family lineage will generally be extended through the son. 
I don't know whether there are exceptions to this in Indian culture. I believe in Chinese culture, there can be cases where the family lineage can be extended through the wife, but I might be wrong about this. Okay. I think in Burmese culture, perhaps again, I might be wrong, that the family lineage can be extended through the wife's, through the wife. Okay, he will manage the inheritance. So this, the inheritance from the parents goes to the son, but then it's the, usually it's the wife who then will manage the household accounts. So in any way, then the wife gets to be in charge of, of the legacy. And then when we have passed on, he will give an offering on our behalf. And maybe this needs a little explanation for, especially for the Westerners who are not familiar with the traditional Indian or Buddhist or Hindu culture, that once the parents pass away, then what the surviving children will do, they will perform what they call, we call it in Sinhalese, Pinkama, or in Pali, it would be Punyakama, an act of merit, usually in the form of an offering to the monastic order, to the monks' community of monks and nuns, and then, or else they'll establish some kind of charitable, make some charitable donation, or maybe construct some memorial building or something, or contribute to the construction of a temple, do some kind of meritorious action, and then they dedicate the merit of that deed to the departed parents. <laughs> and having lived in, in Sri Lanka for more than 20 years, in my experience, the one who takes the initiative in performing the act of merit <laughs> is usually not the son, <laughs> but it's the daughter or the wife of, of the son of the family, who's the one who generates the enthusiasm and takes the steps to, to perform that meritorious deed. Bhante, even the Hindus do that. They do pujas and offerings like yeah, when their yeah. parents, so yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, it's part of the common Indian tradition. Uh, yeah, and then it, it, from there it passes to other countries which have come under the influence of Hinduism and Buddhism, particularly Buddhism in Thailand, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, um, probably in China as well, the Chinese culture. Okay, the verse just summarizes. Yeah, initially it just summarizes the main part of the point of the Pro Sutta. But then that the last few lines are interesting because here we see a shift in the emphasis. So it says, therefore, good persons, grateful and appreciative, support their mother and father, recalling how they helped one in the past, doing what is necessary for them as they did for oneself in the past. So this is emphasizing the gratitude towards one's parents. And then the last verse, again, puts a kind of ethical emphasis on the types of qualities that are needed. It says that endowed with faith and virtuous, the son is worthy of praise. Yeah, so these are the main sort of qualities that are being enjoined in the sutta is having faith and undertaking certain or en enacting certain virtuous qualities, especially returning the kindness of the parents by looking after them in their old age, serving them while, while they're alive, and then performing deeds of merit on their behalf. Okay, we'll take a few suttas, then we could take some questions. Okay, here the sutta begins with a simile. So it speaks about how 
great sal trees. And these are the Indian sal trees. It's kind of a large tree that grows in northern India. Probably, a, certainly it will grow in the Himalayas. So when great sal trees grow, they grow in five ways. In branches, leaves, and foliage, all rolled into one. They grow in bark, in shoots, in softwood, and in heartwood. Okay, so then it continues. It applies the simile. So it says, when the head of the family is endowed with faith, the people in the family who depend on him grow in five ways. And by faith here, I would say is meant not just, not faith is blind belief, but this would be trust. And particularly in this case, it's trust in the Buddha or in the triple gem, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And that faith acts as the, let's say, the seed through which in one's own life, one will develop the virtuous behavior, ethical behavior, that one will devote oneself to learning, to study, particularly to study the Buddha Dharma, to, through, through faith that one practices generosity, acts of charity. And in the Buddhist context, it would include and maybe emphasize generosity and supporting the monastic order to ensure that the community of the monks and nuns have temples in which to live, the robes, alms food, medicines, and other supports. And through faith that one, and through faith con conjoined with learning and practice, that one develops wisdom. And so through faith in one's own life, one applies oneself to observing the precepts and other types of ethical behavior, learning generosity and developing wisdom. And then when one develops those qualities oneself, one serves as a model for the people in one's family to emulate and one also actively encourages them through instruction. Sometimes one has to lay down rules, but mainly through instruction and example to encourage all of those people in the family to also develop faith, to plant the seeds of faith, and through the seeds of faith to observe good behavior through the precepts, to learn, to go to listen to discourses on the Dhamma or to study Dharma books, to practice generosity and acts of charity, and to try to develop wisdom. So in this way, the head of the family endowed with faith enables the people in the family to grow in these five ways. And for the head of the family, the sutta uses the word kula putting, and putting is lord or master. And it, again, it's a word that has a masculine connotations. But again, <laughs> what I've seen in my own experience for many years in Sri Lanka, that it's usually or most often it's the mother <laughs> who <laughs> encourages the children to grow in faith, virtuous behavior, learning, generosity, and wisdom. <laughs> yeah, I remember sometimes when I would be staying in a temple, I would see that when there's the uposita observance, like 80% of the lay people who attend the uposita observance, the poya day, are women. <laughs> and then I asked the, <laughs> the head monk, why is it that most of the people who are coming are women? Where are the men? <laughs> and the head monk said to me, there's a cricket game today. <laughs> and for those who don't know, like the cricket is the, for India, Sri Lanka, Australia, it's the great, I think Great Britain as well. It's the international equivalent of our American baseball. So, so when there's a choice between going for the temple to observe the posita day 
or staying home and watching the cricket game on television or going to the cricket stadium to watch the cricket match. <laughs> the women go to the temple for the observance. <laughs> the men watch the cricket match. Yeah, so I have to change the verse to say <laughs> when the female head of the family here possesses faith and virtue, her, her husband, hopefully, and the children and relatives and all will grow in dependence on her. <laughs> so too, her companions, her family circle, and those who depend on her. Mm. No, that was a little mischievous idea that just came into my mind <laughs> to do a survey to see <laughs> who in this class now, how many males do we have and how many females? <laughs> no, but I won't do that. Okay, now we come to the next chapter, but it seems to be continuing a, a common thread, which is different aspects of family life. So this is Sutta now 41, and this is the theme of this Sutta is the proper way of utilizing wealth. And the Buddha is speaking to Anatta Pindika, who is the chief male patron of the Buddha and the Sangha. And Anatta Pindika was supposed to be a very wealthy householder. And as we know, he was the one who put out the funding for the purchase of what used to be known as Prince Jeta's Grove. And Anatta Pindika used his wealth to purchase the grove from the prince and then offered it to the Buddha and the Sangha. And so then the park became known as Anatta Pindika's Park in the city of Savati or Shravasti. And if you go on pilgrimage to India, you can visit Shravasti and you'll see there, I think it's been restored, Anatta Pindika's park. So here the Buddha is speaking to Anatta Pindika and he's speaking about five ways that a householder should utilize wealth. And I find this particularly important for lay people to read and to understand because too many people get the idea that the only proper way of Buddhist practice, and particularly when Buddhism is coming to new countries like the US, is to try to like imitate the lifestyle of monastics. So you think that the real way to practice Buddhism is you go on the meditation retreat. That is real Buddhism. And then when you leave the retreat setting, you go back home and you're just living an ordinary life. But the Buddha lays down certain sort of guidelines. They're not commandments, but guidelines on how to live a household life guided by, governed by, grounded upon the Dharma. And so he's speaking about a householder who's, and this would be earning his living by right livelihood. So he's, striving, he's working diligently at his job, whatever it might be, acquiring his wealth by the strength of his arms. Apparently this would be directed towards the cultivator, the farmer of the Buddha's time, but it, we could extend it, whether it's a computer operator, computer programmer, business person, a white collar worker, blue collar worker, whatever but they're earning their wealth by the sweat of the brow, but it's righteous wealth, righteously gained. So how does the householder or the lay disciple, the noble lay disciple use the wealth that's acquired? And first he uses it, he or she uses it to make himself happy and pleased and maintain himself in happiness. Then he makes his parents happy and pleased and maintains them in happiness. Then he makes his wife and children, this I'll have to comment on, his slaves, workers and servants, happy and pleased and maintains them in happiness. So that's the first way of utilizing wealth. 
And so one utilizes, utilizes the wealth. One makes oneself happy. The Buddha doesn't enjoin on lay people what's called sometimes a this worldly asceticism. That's the ideal of, I think it's Calvinism, the branch of Christianity arose in, I believe in Switzerland in Geneva, then spread to, especially to the Netherlands. So that we have the Dutch Reformed Church, I believe is the Calvinist church. In America, I believe it's the Presbyterians, though their way of thinking is very different from that of original Calvinism. The idea is that one should live very frugally, very ascetically, even while one is working and acquiring a lot of wealth. And that is supposed to be the sign According to Calvinism, original Calvinism, everybody is predestined to their final destination. Whether one is saved or damned is determined entirely by the will of God, predestination. And um, the sign that one is favored, that one has received God's grace, is one's ability to succeed and prosper in one's livelihood in one's business enterprises. But one is supposed to live, to I guess, to sustain God's grace, to live very frugally, very ascetically, not enjoying the wealth, which is a kind of sin. But for Buddha, for the Buddha, the lay disciples should enjoy, use that wealth to enjoy himself, not to indulge in kinds of unwholesome types of enjoyment but to have a satisfactory standard of living. One could have a nice home, nice furniture. In today's world, one will need a car to get around. And one could have various kinds of worldly enjoyments as long as they're not on the unwholesome side. And one also uses it to support the whole household. You know, what might raise some eyebrows. Why is the Buddhist here speaking about slaves? And I mean, this troubles me a little bit. Like, why doesn't the Buddha come out and say, you know, that slavery is an unjust institution and try to oppose it and denounce it? But I think the Buddha, again, he's speaking against the cultural background of his time where slavery was an institution. And what he encourages is that, and probably since it was not a highly monetized culture, there would not be that much of a difference between the workers of the, a wealthy householder would have a large um, staff, including workers and servants. And there would not be that much difference between the workers and the slaves, except that the workers can go, go about on their own, whereas the slaves are bound to follow the instructions of the householder. But anyway, I think it's in accordance with sort of the spirit of Buddhism to be, especially nowadays, to be opposed to any kind of, certainly to slavery. But we have to remember this is India in the fifth century BC. Okay, then coming to the next way of utilizing wealth with the wealth that one earns, righteous wealth, one uses that wealth to make one's friends and companions happy and pleased. So one supports one's friends and companions, not becoming a spendthrift, but one should use it to maybe to make gifts to them, to maybe one will hold parties and celebrations and invite them to these parties and celebrations. So this is part of ordinary life, and one will use it to make, you know, to help one's friends and companions. Okay, the third use of wealth, this would be the equivalent of taking out insurance policies. So one makes provisions with the wealth against the losses that might arise because of fire or floods. People in California or the Southwest, you know, this would be relevant to them today. People in the Southeast, New Orleans, Mississippi, 
Florida, Pakistan, relevant to them, the same. But of course, now it's intensifying these disasters due to fires and floods. Um, losses due to kings. The yeah, kings could be, in the Buddhist time, even today, could be quite unscrupulous in making demands on the population, trying to raise large amounts of money by heavy taxes in order to build up their military, in order to launch wars of aggression. And then, of course, there will be bandits and unloved heirs. So one has to write the will to ensure that one's wealth will go to one's dear relatives and not be taken over by unloved, undear relatives. So that's the third way of utilizing wealth, which actually has quite a wide range. And then the fourth one has still a wider range. So this is what is called the five oblations. And I think probably this term, my guess is that this term, the five oblations, maybe comes from the Vedic culture, but then the Buddha maybe adapted it to his own teaching. So one makes certain offerings. I don't you know, fully understand this in all respects to relatives. I guess one would give a certain amount to support one's relatives. So it seems that there would be some overlap between four and no, this is different friends and companions. Yeah, so this maybe would be more distant relatives, uncles, aunts, cousins who might need some financial assistance. And guests, this would be very important in traditional cultures. In Indian culture, it's said that the guest is second in importance to the deity himself. So when a guest comes to visit, when you have a visitor, you're supposed to make offer them some refreshments. And if you have like an overnight guest or guest who's going to be staying a few days, you have to offer them a little gift as well as the meals and the lodging. So one uses it to support guests. And then ancestors, this would be making offerings, the traditional offerings, and dedicating the merit to the departed ancestors, to one's parents and generations, older generations, grandparents, and so forth. And there would probably be traditional ceremonies, even predating the Buddha's time for offerings to ancestors. Then there'll be the legitimate taxation from the king. And then oblations, offerings to the deities. And so the Buddha, again, he, in order to blend his own teaching into the traditional Indian culture, it's not like some of the monotheistic religions which say smash the idols, get rid of all of the older religions and just worship us, our God. But the Buddha will you know, accept the deities of the traditional Indian culture and allow his followers to make offerings to, to them because the belief is that the deities have an active, some kind of active, influence in the conduct of our worldly affairs, our mundane affairs. And so one would do acts of merit and dedicate the merit to the deities. And one will also make offerings to them like incense, flowers, fruits. Um, I guess some other items one would offer to the go to the, there would be like trees that are sacred to the deities, temples dedicated to the deities, shrines dedicated to the deities. And even, even in Sri Lanka, in the Buddha's temples, there would be the main hall. You would have the statue of the Buddha, and maybe on the side, the statue of Sariputta, Moggallana. In the background, there'll be the paintings of the monks, nuns, and lay male and female lay followers venerating the Buddha. But then on the side of the temple would be a separate area 
um, which is the area where they'll have the shrines to the deities. And so people, when they come to the temple, first they pay homage to the Buddha and the disciples. Then they'll go off to the side, the shrines in the side and make little offerings to the deities. Of course, you want to get in the good favor of the deities. So if you want your son or daughter to get a good job, to get into a good school, to succeed in their studies, um, protection in times of illness. It's not the Buddha and the Arhat disciples who look after those matters, but that's where the deities come in. Okay, then the fifth use of wealth. Okay, this is one uses the wealth to establish an uplifting offering of alms to those ascetics and Brahmins. And remember last week, I think that question came up, why Brahmins? These would not be the like ordinary Brahmins who are householders performing the rituals, but these would probably be Brahmin renunciants who have left the household life to dedicate themselves to a life of contemplation. So these are ascetics and Brahmins who refrain from intoxication and heedlessness, who are settled in patience and mildness, who devote their time to taming themselves, calming themselves, and training themselves for nirvana. So that is the the offering to support in contemporary times would be using some of one's wealth to support the monastic order, the monastics. Okay, so those are that's the five five ways of utilizing wealth. And then, yeah, this is interesting. The Buddha says, if a noble disciple's wealth is exhausted when it's been used in these five ways, he thinks I've used my wealth in these five ways and my wealth is exhausted, but he has no regrets. And if his wealth increases when he uses it in these five ways, again, he thinks, I have no regrets. Okay, we'll just take number 42, then, then we could take some questions. In a way, this is very similar to another sutta that we just took a few minutes ago. So it said that when a good person is born in a family, it's for the good welfare and happiness of many people. It's for the good welfare of his parents, his wife and children, the slaves, workers and servants, friends and companions, ascetics and Brahmins. And then we have a very nice simile. It's like when it, there's a great rain cloud arises and it pours down its rain and it nurtures all of the crops. So whether it's the wheat, corn, barley, um, the maize, rice, all of those crops benefit from the rain. And so when the good person arises, he or she appears for the good welfare and happiness of many people. Yeah, and then this is interesting, the verse that the deities protect him who is guarded by the Dharma, who has managed his wealth for the welfare of many. Yeah, so when one lives this virtuous, righteous life, it's that even the deities protect one. Okay, maybe we could say if we have any questions. And if you want to ask questions, you use the hand symbol. Okay, I see somebody with iPhone. Wow, a lot of questions. The person with the iPhone, no name. But
Yeah, you would have to unmute. Maybe the maybe they didn't intend to ask the question. Okay, next will be V. Yes. Uh, good morning, Bante. Good morning. I have to, uh, yeah. The first question is: um, How do we distinguish between deities and deva? I mean. In, in Buddhism, normally we mention about Deva and Devi. So the deities is, um, who are this deity? How can we distinguish them? And also yakas. <laughs> yeah, there's no difference between Deva and deity. Deity is just the English translation for Deva. But I think as for these deities that are said to protect one, my guess is that there are the devas who dwell in the various heavenly worlds, but in the traditional Indian belief, there are also the earth and sky dwelling devas. So those devas have a closer interconnection with the human realm. Whereas the devas in the heavenly world are much more remote from us. So we don't have so much interaction with them. So the devas, the earth devas and the sky devas, because they're part of this world system itself, so they will interact with the human realm. And maybe questions, people will have questions popping in their mind. This is Bhikkhu Bodhi, a modern Westerner, grew up in New York City, believing in devas, speaking about devas and these Buddhist texts. Buddha is supposed to be enlightened. How could it be speaking about these devas? This is my supposition. That in ancient times, when people were living simpler lives and much more natural lives, and there were few, the human population was so much smaller. You know, I think the human population first hit the billion people mark at the beginning of the 20th century. In the Buddhist time, the human population may be 100 million people in the world. So there was much less of a, of a human presence in the world, much vast wildernesses, fields, and so on. And so I think that the devas, the presence of the devas would be, have been much stronger and there would have been much more frequent inter interactions between the devas and human beings. But once the human population increases, just the way the animal population declines and then cities come up and machinery and burning of fossil fuels, combustion, pollution, you know, all of that chases all other forms of life. Even the bird population is disappearing. So the devas probably fly away, flee away and remain in space and don't want to interact very much with the human population. So that's why we don't see so many cases of interaction with the devas. But I say that I, I've never actually seen <laughs> devas with my own eyes, but I lived for many years, it was 14 years, 18 years actually in Sri Lanka in Uduwatakeli, which is a forest just behind the Temple of the Tooth, where the Buddha's tooth relic is kept. And when you walk through that forest, because it's very close to the temple with the tooth relic, one could feel some kind of other presence in that forest. And my supposition is that those are the devas that protect the Temple of the Tooth. Thank you. Can I ask another, another question, Bhante? Yeah, I, I was just thinking of something else. Yeah, this was the year 1997 or 98. I think it was the beginning of 1998. There was in, in, in Sri Lanka, there was this ethnic war going on and the militant group was the Tamil Tigers and they launched an attack on their intention was to drive a van filled with explosives into the temple of the tooth 
and then detonate it so that it would explode and destroy the temple, the, uh, I'm sorry, the tooth relic of the Buddha. But they got to the gate and then the ex explosion went off and it damaged the temple and a few people were killed, a few p pedestrians, but the temple itself, the temple itself was only minim minimally damaged and the tooth relic was not damaged at all. So one might suppose that it was the devas that in some way were protecting the tooth relic. Okay, please, yeah. Yeah, um, the second question is regarding what you just mentioned about um, the cultivating of all crops and you mentioned maize. Um, I just wonder, uh, is that maize farmer during Buddha's time? Actually, the, in the Buddhist in India, uh, there would not have been maize. Maize is, I think, it is originally a, a, a crop originally native to the Americas. Right. Okay. Yeah, we would. And, they wouldn't have had what we call corn here in the, in the U.S. They wouldn't have that. They wouldn't have had that in, in India, but there would have been especially rice and probably wheat and yeah, barley. Yeah, think, yeah. I think in Vika Nigaya, I did saw the word maize. So I was wondering whether there was maize um, farmer during Buddha's time. Yeah, I don't think what we call maize would have been in India in the Buddha's time. Right. Okay. Thank you. I have no further question. Thank you, okay. Bhante. Okay. Okay. Next, Yudi. Yudi. Oh, yes. Hi, Bante. Hi. Sorry. Um, so my question is uh, with regards to the offerings to, to the devas, yeah. um, wouldn't that sort of contradict the view of rites and rituals or the wrong view of rites and rituals? I say not necessarily. <laughs> it's not that, not, not, not that I'm an advocate of making offerings to the deities, <laughs> saying you should all set up shrines for the deities and make offerings to them. But what is meant by that fetter or bond of rites and rituals is the belief that one could achieve purification and liberation just by performing certain rites and rituals. To achieve that purification, one has to go through you know, the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path. But the rites and what the, the little ritual of making the oblations to the deities is kind of an exchange for a, a method of obtaining the protection of the deities. And so one does this as a way of, of course, probably in the, uh, certainly the Buddha would have seen that there are these deities who have some capacity to influence human affairs and to protect those who make offerings to them. And so the purpose of making the offering to the deity is not to purify one's own heart and to gain liberation, but to show some concern. In a way it's done out of compassion for the deities because the deities subsist on the merits that are offered to them by human beings. And so the, the proper Buddhist way of making offerings to the deities is that one does meritorious deeds, wholesome deeds, and then one shares the merit with the deities. And then by sharing the merit with the deities, then they will exercise their protective force to protect yourself, your family, or to protect the human population. So even the verses that we I usually recite at the end of the class, akasa ta chabumata deva naga mahidika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu sasanang. So we say the devas and the nagas of great power, let them rejoice in these merits. And by so rejoicing, let them protect the sasana, that's the Buddha's teaching, protect the desana, the, te the teaching of the Dhamma, and chirangra kantu mangpurang, let them protect 
myself and others. Yeah, so it's a way of like, one makes the offering of sharing one's merit with the deities, but also making material offerings in order to secure the blessings of the deities. Yeah, so it's not the fetter of rites and rituals. Okay, yeah. but I also heard that the devas don't need, they, I mean, they think that humans smell, they don't even like our smell, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't even think that they get involved with us. I mean, you know, so they don't care about us. <laughs> no, they do, they do. Or at least that's the traditional belief is that they do. Um, because they're, they depend upon us for they depend upon our merits. So when we perform meritorious deeds that we share them with the, the merits with the deities and the deities rejoice in our merits and then that strengthens the deities and it's a way of winning their favor so that they protect us. Okay, we'll have to take, I see a lot of questions, we'll have to move on. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. Yeah, okay, Mariam. Yes, thank you, Bhante. I have, uh... Uh, a question about if you can talk about why the Buddha chose not to take any action with regard to the slaves, to the women, to all the other um, yeah. issues that existed back then and only chose to talk about the caste that um, said they all equal, doesn't yeah. matter what. Yeah. Yeah, I have to say it's a, a, a problem that also weighs on my mind. Um, like, why didn't the Buddha sort of stand up and say, you know, he didn't even say, let us abolish the caste system and institute a system of, you know, complete social equality. But what he criticized is the idea that caste status in some way reflects a person's moral and spiritual worth or capacities. And he holds up the examples of people from the, even from the outcast community who have reached like the highest spiritual attainment. The example of Sunita, who was an outcast who became an arhat and was worshiped by Brahma and Chakra, the king of the gods. Um, Perhaps, I don't know, maybe the Buddha saw that these institutions are just in his time, which is so firmly established that there was nothing that he could do about them. I, I you know, Bhante, sometimes I get really angry at him. I don't know how to. <laughs> I say, okay, I have goodwill to <laughs> yeah. good, do goodwill, you know, meditations. I didn't know how to handle that anger that arises because I'm yeah. a female, because I've been subject to all those other things. And I kind of um, don't know how to handle that, but that's, that's another issue. I think it's a, sometimes a question comes to my mind, can somebody even, again, I might sound a little heretical here. Can somebody, even a fully enlightened Buddha fully see through some of the sort of cultural and institutional structures of the time, the era in which he's living. I see. That's... Yeah, perhaps it's not possible. I, I have full confidence in him as the fully enlightened one who's seen, you know, the ultimate truth and also gives the wisest practical advice for the conduct of everyday life. But perhaps certain social institutions are just so like social and cultural institutions and structures and patterns are just so deeply ingrained in the thinking of somebody brought up in that period that one can't even see through them. Perhaps, I just don't know. Yeah, perhaps, thank you. Uh, Bonte, with regard to deities, I don't know too much about them. Neither do I see... really. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I bet you know a little bit more than I do. <laughs> With regard to offering them food, they do not eat food. I've seen the shrines and everything. When you say offer food, it's just like, it doesn't make sense to me. 
Yeah, well, don't forget also uh, all the Buddhist temples, they'll take there's a, a tray in which there are special dishes and then they'll put a, a portion of rice in one little bowl and then on the little dishes, they'll put the side, the different vegetable dishes, the curries and so forth. And then on a little tray, another little dish, they'll put some fruits and sweets and they offer them to the Buddha. And of course the Buddha statue is not, <laughs> not going to, but it's a way in the case of making the offering to the Buddha, it's a sort of symbolic way, or at least of training the mind to be showing reverence to the Buddha by offering what is most valuable and what's pr most precious, the first offering of food one offers to the to the Buddha before one partakes of it oneself, even before one offers it, if it's a, a Sangha dana, an offering to the Sangha, even before one offers to the monastics, one offers the first portion to the Buddha. So what happens to those foods then? Um, what do they do with that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, there seems to be a difference in the Sh Sri Lankan Indian tradition, Indian based tradition, and the Chinese tradition. I I've seen in the Sri Lanka, I'm sorry to say, but the food gets discarded, but animals will come and eat it. So it doesn't go to complete waste. So it gets consumed mm -hmm. by living beings. I see mm -hmm. here at the Chinese monastery, they'll take the offering that's originally given to the Buddha, the rice. And then it goes into the big bowl of rice that humans will consume. Okay, okay. Thank you, Bhante. Okay. Okay, next, Elizabeth. Yes, thank you, Bhante. I just want to follow up uh, with your uh, comments about the more female women um, in, the, um, in the audience. And um, I want to share um, a phrase that I learned from Indian um, in Tasmania, Australia. What he says is, you raise a son for his wife. You raise a daughter for your life. And mm. um, I, I, I shared this with many friends and they all seem to share, I mean, agree with this idea because women tend to do more their work and um, men are busy with whatever their work and um, I guess leaves women to do the main, the rest of the family. Um, yeah, there's, maybe there's some truth in that. But I, I don't want to alienate our <laughs> our male students. Uh, well, just because if people have different focuses and enough energy to do that. Yeah, yeah. The, the thing, the question I have is why there is this kind of difference between five ablations versus the offering of elms. I mean, I would kind of assume they are sort of the same thing. No, I think the offering of alms here is specifically the offering of alms to the renunciants, to the Shramana Brahmana, to the ascetics and Brahmins, whereas the offering, the oblations are given to Okay, I see. Yeah, I to see. guests, let's see. To relatives, guests, the ancestors, the king and the deities. It's kind of the taking care of the lay people and also the monastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that was Elizabeth. Then with next we have Vero. Good morning, Bante. Good, good morning. morning, Dama. I would ask, and I, I have a curiosity. Sharing merits is the same as transferring merits to the deceased and how it works in relation to the gamma of uh, the beings. The being who shares the merit or who receives? Uh, sharing it? merits is the same uh, when we said uh, transference of merits, it's the same uh, yeah. thing. What they call transference of merit in a way, it's a maybe it's a wrong expression no, it's a common one because it's not like you do a bank transfer, right? You transfer money from your account to another account. So your account goes down and the account of the other person or the company goes up. But with mm -hmm. the transference of merit, you don't lose the merit that you've acquired. But what you do 
mentally you invite others and this would be the deities or departed relatives or beings in general to rejoice in the merits that you have created through your good deeds and then by their rejoicing they generate merits in turn that will be beneficial to them so that is what actually is taking place so we call that the sharing of the merits so they're rejoicing in the good deeds that you've done and you rejoice in the good deeds that you've done so in that way it's sort of like sharing a you've prepared a, a big meal and then you put it out on the table and everybody is enjoying the meal yeah does that answer the question uh, well um it's because in the betavatu, betavatu. yeah wait um, I I, go, go on um okay yeah yeah and for example this is a good gamma for for the diseases and in the place of the maybe in the realm of ghosts, they this kind of rejoicing brings to them a better conditions in the way they are living there. That, yeah, that's what it said. That's what it said. So mm -hmm. when you say you share the merit with the so-called hungry ghosts, then they are able to rejoice in that merit, and that alleviates some of their misery in their in their realm. Thank you, Vante. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Heinz. Next is Heinz. Yeah. Hi. Good morning, Vante. Good morning. Um, what I find interesting about these particular suttas is um, the Buddha is not addressing monastics. He's not addressing um, declared lay followers. Um, he certainly is not addressing people who have, you know, uh, gone for the homeless life. He's addressing ordinary people um, who, uh, in, who are not ready to let go of the desire for sense pleasure. And yet he is offering um, a path for them in a, in a sense, right. um, you know, uh, uh, something they can do to, uh, to move from a less ethical to a more ethical way of life uh, without asking that they, um, and, and this is my question, I don't see him asking that they take um, refuge in him, in the Buddha. Uh, they, they, they can. Is that is that correct? I mean, um, the, the, so this would be very comparable to the kinds of ethics that you find in Confucianism, in you know um, Islam, Christianity. Just raise a good moral family. Um, yeah, that's actually a good point at least most of the advice here would be advice that would be applicable to, let's say to you know, any householder, no matter what their specific religious or spiritual co convictions might be. So it involves, yeah, you know, well, sort of general or, or universal ethical principles, at least that's implied by the mention of good deeds the virtuous good conduct and so on which would imply observing the basic precepts of not killing not stealing no sexual misconduct no deceptive speech um practice of generosity learning of course when you get to wisdom then there would be sort of pointing in the direction of the liberating wisdom of the buddha's teaching though he doesn't at this point he doesn't spell it out specifically in that way but this would be sort of the teaching of you know, the fundamental virtues of the virtuous life, using the word virtue in the broad sense, mm. not narrow to ethical conduct, but including things like generosity, wisdom, honesty, and so forth. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think this also sheds a little light on this, why he doesn't challenge the, the social hierarchy, you know, like the, you know, He's talking to people who are not ready to do that. They, they yeah, that's a good. Be, yeah, that's be a ready good to point. let yeah. go of slaves or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, and again, what he emphasizes is treating everybody with kindness and serving as an example of virtuous conduct. Yeah. For everybody in one sphere of influence. In in your book about the words of the Buddha, you have the introduction at some point where you say that. 
the image behind it is a sort of conception of society as a, a concentric circle uh, that emanates a series of con concentric circles that starts with a family and and is is in some ways dependent on a on an integrity on a on a moral integrity of family life yeah and then emanates out from there yeah uh, exactly yeah 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 thank you okay okay next is i Ailey. thank you bante uh bante i'm just wondering the suttas that we have studied today, are they the same suttas as the Sigalovada Sutta, which is in Diga Digaya? Yeah. Because uh, the content are quite similar, but these suttas are in Anguttara Nikaya, but the uh, Sigalovada is in the Diga Digaya. Yeah. So uh, perhaps are they like, uh, perhaps uh, is it the Buddha is propagated in a different uh, occasions and they have a different name of the suttas or they are the Sigalovada suttas, which are the in the Diga Digaya? Thank you. Yeah. I, I didn't quite catch the question. Oh, okay. Um, I repeat again. I'm yeah. just wondering, the suttas that we studied just now, Yeah. are they the Sigalovada suttas? Because uh, Sigalovada sutta is in Tika um, uh, yeah. uh, no, Dikaya. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. No, yeah. It's, it's not the Sigalovada sutta. Sigalovada sutta is a much longer sutta in the Dega Nikaya. Right, right. So yeah. these are the different suttas, but they are, they are in Anguttara Nikaya. Yeah, yeah. A, a little similar in themes in that they're <clears throat> the Sigalovada Sutta, the Buddha is giving advice to a young man about how to how to form wholesome social relations, the relations between parents and children, husband and wife, employer and employees teacher and students, friends and friends, and religious teachers and disciples. So that's, and then what are the responsibilities of each group to the other? That's laid out in the Sigalovada Sutta. So this Sutta is different, or these Suttas are different, but in a way they're in the same spirit of what are the appropriate ways to, you know, to live in society. Yes, yes, yes. It talked about wealth than, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bande. Okay. The next is your wrong. Yes, Bande. Uh, my question is about the difference between punya and gunna. Last week, we uh, you taught us about uh, the merits or the benefits from giving. Yeah. So the, the, the three different fields of merits. Yeah. And I assume the merits there was generated from punya. Yeah. So this week we spoke. You you spoke more about uh, virtues and faith and learning. Yeah. And that I suppose that has more to do with guna. With guna. Yeah. Guna. So my question is: uh, Is there any difference between the um, creation of punya and guna? And is there any difference between the results of punya and guna? <laughs> yeah, okay, the word. Yeah, it's guna with the N has a dot under it. Yeah, the word guna actually becomes more prominent in the later period of Buddhism. It's not so common in the Nikayas in that sense. But okay, let us say that the meaning of the word guna would be good, I would call us good qualities of character, good character traits. So guna would include things like generous would include the ethical virtues like generosity following of precepts being um having gratitude being humble being respectful and reverential um practicing kindness and compassion 
And then the intellectual virtues like learning and wisdom, all of those would be included under the concept of guna. So I translate guna as good qualities or excellent qualities. Or even we could use the word virtues in the broad sense, the sort of Aristotelian sense of both moral qualities and intellect, good moral qualities and good intellectual qualities. And the word guna, I would say, is not tied in by itself, it's not tied in to the concept of actions of karma and its fr and their fruits, action and its fruits, whereas punya derives its meaning from that law relationship of actions and their fruits, karma and the results of karma. So within that framework, punya is wholesome karma considered from the standpoint of its capacity to produce desirable results, to lead to the capacity of good actions, of virtuous actions, to bring good health, a longer lifespan, beauty, a good reputation, um, and rebirth in higher realms, and ultimately to become a contributing factor for liberation, for the attainment of the paths and fruits. So merit is a contributing factor for the, the, the achievement of those goals. Whereas guna, so let's say punya has more, you could say an instrumental value. It's the good actions considered as means for achieving desirable ends, whereas guna highlights the value, the intrinsic value, the inherent value of good qualities of the virtues. It highlights good qualities as something beautiful and worthy within themselves, not looking at them from the standpoint of their capacity to produce desirable results in the future even though the qualities comprised under guna, under the virtues would also be generating merit that will produce those desirable results in the future. But when we just focus on the concept of guna, then it just highlights the intrinsic value of those good qualities rather than their instrumental value in producing desirable results. Does that make it clear? Yes, Vande. Sorry, I uh, couldn't find the microphone. Okay. Okay. We'll take one more question, and this will be Hung Lim. Uh, thank you, Vande. Uh, just commenting on what just now you mentioned about transferring of merits and that uh, this is sharing of merits. I read before somewhere where they say that transference of merits is uh, to those departed uh, persons, whereas sharing of merits is to any living thing. So uh, can Pante clarify? No, I, I don't think I would have said that, or at least that wasn't my intention. Um, no, you didn't say that, but all I mean is I read something about this. So. Oh, I see. Yeah, I, I don't know, actually. It seems to me that they're pretty much the same thing. But maybe when it's done in a more ritualized form, we call it the transference of merit. And then it's done for the purpose of sharing one's merit with departed relatives or with the beings in some of the undesirable realms, like especially with the hungry ghosts, but also transferring the merit to the, yeah, yeah, especially dedicating that merit to help the beings in realms of suffering. Whereas sharing the merits, you could say, is done just in a more general universal way. But this is just maybe personal interpretation. I don't know any kind of formal distinction between those two. Okay, thank you, Bhante. Okay, I think we're going to have to stop now. 
with the sharing, <laughs> stop with the sharing or, of the merits or the, yeah, I would call what we do the sharing of the merits at the end of the session. But before I do this, I want to issue the reminder that this afternoon from 3 to 5 p.m., the organization that I established called Buddhist Global Relief will be having a special program, online program, called Creating a More Compassionate World. And it will be highlighting some of the projects of Buddhist Global Relief, but also including talks by some of the distinguished Dharma teachers of today, including Joseph Goldstein from the Insight Meditation Center in Barry, Massachusetts, the Ugandan Bhikkhu Buddha Rakita, Venerable Saranapala from Toronto, Canada, Karma Legshit Somo, the first American woman to take full ordination in the Tibetan tradition, and some other speakers. And so if you are free this afternoon, please join us to register. You have to register to join in order to get the Zoom link. So you go to the website of Buddhist Global Relief, and then you'll see that the headliner is that for the program. And then you click that, and then you can register. Sorry, Monday, if we are not be able to join, will there be uh, uh, recorded and uploaded in the yeah, YouTube? It, 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 yeah, it will be recorded and then it will come up on the web website of Buddhist Global Relief and probably oh, on, on YouTube, on the YouTube channel for Buddhist Global Relief. Thank you. Thank you, Monday, thank you so much. Okay, so let us <laughs> share, share the merit with the devas. Those are the deities. The nagas, those are the, <laughs> the dragon spirits and the Buddhas, the fierce spirits, the protectors of the Dharma, and inviting them, requesting them to protect the Dharma, to protect the world, to protect living beings. Akasa ta chabumata deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditpa chirang rakantu sasanang. Akasa ta chabumata deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditpa chirang rakantu deisanang. Akasa ta chabumata deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditpa Chirang rakantu mang parang, dukha pata jani dukha, bhaya pata jani bhaya, soka pata jani soka, hantu sabepi pani no. May those in suffering be free from suffering. May those in fear be free from fear. May those in sorrow be free from sorrow. May all living beings also be thus. Sadhu, 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 sadhu,